Welcome back, everybody. This is Bolo 15, the final chapter of our saga. And right now, we are preparing all the surfaces of the knife to their final grit finish and uh, getting ready for the final etch. So right here I have just a cheapo file that I wore out, but then I glued a uh, contact cemented some hard leather onto one face and I use it as a sanding backer a lot of the time. I think I'm using some 400 grit here just to get it to the, a, a good finish for etching and then coffee. Um, in the background, you can probably hear it a little bit. A lot of the time I use wireless earbuds, but sometimes I just like the shop stereo to listen to. Um, I'm listening to like Geographics on YouTube. He's talking about North Korea or something like that. I listen to a wide range of topics. Some of it soaks in, some of it doesn't. At any rate, it does help pass the time when you're sitting here doing this more tedious work. Here I have found uh, something that's close to the same radius as that uh, scallop on the front of the guard. Of course, this is a large um, felt tip marker. But uh, whatever works, using some 400 grit, even up the finish on that, get it to 400, which is where I'm going to etch at. And uh, I've left a lot of this work in, but speeded it up. Hopefully you don't get too sick of speeding up throughout this video, but I wanted to show a lot of the process. Um, right there I'm using my Baylor belt backer, and now I'm back to the leather-faced file. And I'm going to have to get both sides of the guard, the top, the back, all the way around with this 400 grit. And here we are doing some light sanding of the front radiuses of the spine. We don't want that to feel sharp. Um, and we're working that radius all the way back through the front of the guard. We don't want sharp corners on anything. Rounding everything over here. And we're listening to a podcast that I like called History on Fire. It's a guy named Daniele Bellelli. He talks about all kinds of interesting um, historical and particularly martial arts based topics. It's always been an area of interest of mine. And he put out a recent uh, two-parter on Bruce Lee lately that's uh, it's been pretty interesting. Going all the way back into talking about him learning uh, Wing Chun in Hong Kong under the legendary Ip Man and all this stuff. Pretty pleasant listening while you're working on a knife. So I use this vice a lot. I just flip the knife around in it and grab it different ways. Vertical, sideways, upside down. Sometimes I'll grab another drill press vise in this vise so I can hold things flat. It's kind of a poor man's multi-position vise. It is the Japanese writer Yukio Mishima who says there is no such thing as the uh, Baylor belt backer with the sharp point really shines in little detail areas like this where I can actually take the advantage of the flex of the nose of that thing and kind of the reach of it to uh, full advantage. We're just getting little areas like that to 400 grit with everything else. And I tend to like to get all of the detail areas sanded out first so that I'm done fussing with them while I'm holding it by the blade flats and then I'll just pull a good finish on the blade flats last and then uh, call it etchable from there. All this kind of stuff is a long haul. Just no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Just got to get into that headspace and find something to listen to or think about while you're doing it. Hong Kong would become the capital of China City. Primarily thanks to refugees like Ip Man who brought their art to Hong Kong, Taiwan, and to other places around the world. Hong Kong in particular became one of the hubs for Kung Fu masters still in China. By the time Ip Man arrived in Hong Kong, his wealth and youth were a thing of the past. So he started teaching martial arts for money to make ends meet.
Here I'm using one of those little aluminum oxide falcon tool stones to get into a particularly tight area. I think that one's a 300 something grit. It's good to have a few a few um, tricks in your bag as far as the little detail sanding stuff. But you also encountered it at the ends of the other Chinese folk. You didn't consider in China the way Bruce Lee would play his cards while... And then I have a bunch of little scraps of micarta and G10 of various sizes and shapes laying around that I sand different types of detail with. This one's a little flat one. I use it quite frequently. It's got one rounded edge too for getting up to this or that and one sharp end. But here I'm just using it to get this flat of the Ricasso here, of course. Make sure there's not any stray grinder scratches on it anymore. And all of this stuff has been previously taken up to a A45 Gator Grit belt, so it's quite easy to clean up with 400 grit Rhino wet paper, dry. I like to imagine that sometimes whatever media I'm consuming imbues the knife on on some level. So this blade, uh, if if that's even a thing, which I'm sure it's not, but it's just kind of a fun thing, is uh, this one is steeped in the history of Bruce Lee a little bit during the finishing process. Now I'm working in front of the Ricasso and just blending some of the area um, out by the plunge cut here in preparation for sanding the blade flats in earnest. And here we are on the blade flats at large, at last. This is the last major laborious step on the knife, I would say. Um, usually I just start at the tip, work a few inches of it at a time, get rid of all the scratches, and then work another couple inches overlapping that, and just kind of walk my way forward up the blade. I'm not really caring about J-hooks and stuff like that at this point. Uh, I'm just getting everything to 400, and then I'll pull a little bit better of a finish at the end. But if you're worried about J-hooks the whole time, you're just not going to get anything done. And, uh, I mean, for years, I used sandpaper wet. I would use just plain water, or after a while I'd use Windex, and then i use Simple Green. And they do help the paper cut and not clog, but... At the same time, there's just this mess all over the place when you're working, and uh, you gotta, it gets to be like a sludge under the blade on the knife board, and uh, you gotta keep wiping the blade down and all this. It, it's just a drag. So I've been sanding dry for the last while, and it's not that much slower, and it's more convenient. At any rate, you can see I'm working on a, a recurve knife board there that's made for integrals. It's got a notch cut out where the guard is. I use that thing all the time on knives like this and on chef knives. And I just I cover the whole thing with masking tape to give it a non-marring surface. And when the tape gets a little gross, I peel it off and put fresh masking tape. But, uh, and then you can see that I have it just grabbed in my big bench vise. And then I'm holding the tang of the knife clamped down. Um, with a leather call between it and the the clamp, which helps it actually hold it a lot more securely than just like a steel on steel clamping wood. Looks like I'm pretty much done with the tip there. I'm moving forward away from the tip a little bit. You just need to be careful at all times with your spatial awareness of where the edge and tip of the knife are. Uh, I cut myself a few times in the past, but it's been a long time since I have, and uh, 
I've actually never never stabbed myself on a knife sticking out like this, although you sure could. Which is such a strange, like, off-kilter line that doesn't quite make sense. And he says, all you dance, get I alternate between sitting and standing while standing. Um, you know, for one thing, holding one body position for too long will leave you sore and cramped. And for another thing, if, if I can, you know, standing helps you put a little bit more pressure on the paper and get the work done that much quicker. Then sometimes you want to take a break from that and sit for a while. So it's whatever, whatever makes you comfortable. Right now I've actually switched to listening to a podcast called Sometimes Dead is Better. They talk about a lot of things like uh, horror movies. And uh, I'm actually not that into horror movies, but if they talk about classics like Friday the 13th, it's pretty interesting to hear some of the story behind the scenes and stuff like that. That's one of my one of like my lighter entertainments, and then I'll just go back to a book or something. Just you know, there's a different different listening media for every mood, I suppose. And now you can see I actually am taking full length strokes on that blade all the way up to the plunge, evening things out. I did cut some of the hand sanding out. I mean, it's just an insane thing to watch all of it. But I left it enough in so you can tell. I mean, it's a chore. There's no knife maker that I've met that that hand sanding is their favorite thing, and usually it's their least favorite thing. With the blade sanded out, now I am ready to trademark it. So let's see how I do that. Here's a stencil. I get these from Patricia at Image. Um backslash electromark.com or something. It's a weird URL. Anyway, I made my own etcher and like etching electrode and stuff like that. I'm going to strip the old one off. Every time I put a new craft felt on, sand the pad a little bit, brighten everything up. I'm going to put some electrolyte on there. And uh, I'm etching on DC here for my etching unit. I'm going to hold it down nice and firm. And I etch, I, I'm counting the whole time I etch. So I do a 10 count, and then I lift it for a couple seconds. And I do another 10 count, and I lift it for a couple seconds, just to dissipate heat and let the etching off gas. Um, and then after 10 of those, I take it off, and uh, that's that's usually the depth that I wanted. I need to etch deep enough so that I don't sand my mark out when I clean it up. And then, uh, at, so after 10 of these DC etches, then I will flip it over to AC current and do another 10 etch passes of a little bit faster 10 count. And I'm just blackening the bottom of my mark. I want it to be black ahead of time because I do mask it off. If I wasn't going to mask it off, I wouldn't care because the ferric and the coffee would blacken the bottom. But, uh, so I yeah I just stand here listen to something tough that out and then uh, peel it all off see how we did and there's our mark looks a little rough at this point but uh, you know no bad edges or anything I just put tape on one side and I let it kind of hinge and float free. So I don't get you know, trapped electrolyte with a, an electrical path through it that causes like stencil edge marks and stuff. I'm putting a little neutralizer on there. Simple green also works, but uh, I did get this neutralizer from Electromark and it works well. And that pad is damp with neutralizer, and I'm just making sure there's no little spotting from kind of the frying action of the electrolyte and etching process. Now we're cleaning it up with a little 400 grit on a flat pad. Just getting rid of the little ghosting around the edges of the mark. And uh, this one turned out well. Once I had it sanded back a fair amount. 
using a soft pad here will sometimes get into the bottom of your mark and wipe out your black but often I will just do the last couple strokes with a soft pad just to prettify it I just don't press hard enough that it gets down into the bottom of my mark and here I'm just putting a little bit of a fresh sand out into the blade to get rid of any neutralizer smearing that may be on there there's just a ton of little things about etching that uh, it's almost like a little ritual. You do it so many times. Every knife that you make and so many of them early in the game turn out a little disappointing and you just you have all these little methods and kind of details and hiccups that you learn to kind of prevent any one of those tiny little issues that can arise. So now I'm actually, I wish I'd gotten a better shot of this, not blocked by my dumb hand, but I'm using the brush in the cap of some clear nail polish to um, carefully paint nail polish over the entire mark, everything within the circle. I'm masking it off. It's not as difficult to do that as a person might think. It's just a careful little painting job inside the line, and the line really helps to contain the edges of the nail polish. At any rate, you need to scrub it on there pretty good. It can't be superficial. And with that done, we're just going to let it dry. It needs at least a an hour to get solid. Two hours is, be is better, and overnight gives the very best results. But that's what I use if you saw what I just held up to the camera. And here we are doing the last actual detail. I had forgotten to sand the spine down, so I need to get the spine to a 400 grit lengthwise and also just finish blending out the corner so here I'm doing it entirely by hand using uh, of course some 400 grit on that piece of baler belt and just kind of blending the entire spine and corners of the spine out and then uh, I believe that is the last step before etching so let's get through this And now we are finally done with the entire sanding of the blade, and we'll move on to the sink to do the etch. Alrighty, so the nail polish had cured last night. It's the next day. And so it's hardened up to the point where I can actually wash the whole blade with soap and water and lightly go over it all with a non-abrasive sponge. And it won't, it won't actually um, hurt the bond of the nail polish to the blade. I always do this and just, I go over it and like rinse it once and then go over it again just to make sure that there's no oils on the blade anywhere. And, uh, and then I leave the blade wet, typically, and go right into the ferric with it. I don't wipe it down with a paper towel or anything like that. I find that it can cause streaking, actually. Almost anything you do other than just a pure soap and water will cause streaking. So I actually went and put the blade in the ferric off camera. And then uh, here I'm putting seven pints of water into a stock pot here. Um, I'm showing you my formula for coming up with my etching coffee. I prepare it ahead of time so it actually has time to cool down to room temperature and get ready by the time my blade is done etching in the ferric chloride. So again, seven pints of water as far as I'm concerned here. It all depends on what size your etching tube is. You can scale my recipe up or down. 
I'm going to put it over on the stove on high heat with a cover. Bring it up to boiling. Like so. And then uh, with the water just having come off of boiling, I'm going to add this Nescafe Classico. This is the 10.5 ounce size. It's the larger one. Usually you're going to find it in the ethnic foods over in the um, in like the Mexican food rather than like the American instant coffee. And I only put a little bit in at a, in at a time and stir it. Otherwise it'll just foam right over the top of the container. And th you can imagine that's quite a mess to clean up. Once you get a couple of dollops in there at a time and stir it around, then you can generally add the rest. Stir that around good. I would never drink this stuff. I've never even tried it. It smells terrible. But it works great on steel. Ahead of time, I've filled the sink basin up with cold water. And now I'm letting the hot coffee float around in a cold water bath to cool it off quicker. You don't have to do this, but you do if you're in a hurry and you have the blade already etching elsewhere. And while that coffee's cooling down and the blade is etching, I'm putting 400 grit on the edges of the handle frame. Also a very important step because we want to get a nice visible finish all the way around the edges of that. I think this morning I was listening to Geographics again and he was talking about the uh, Japanese 2011 earthquake and following disaster at Fukushima. A uh, very cheerful topic to be sure, but again, there's just something about disasters that uh, of course always fascinates me. I think that's a pretty common trait in people and uh, nuclear accidents are some of the most horrifying things to think about. But uh, at any rate, it provided suitable entertainment to get through this little bit of work. I guess you could say then that the handle frame of this knife is a little bit imbued in uh, nuclear disaster. Hope that's not bad. We're sharpening, <laughs> sharpening. We're um, now we're polishing just the last little hook on the handle end of the frame there. Just about done with this whole thing. Gotta get the end. And that is going to conclude the last of the sanding on the handle frame. We're going to go wa soap and water that. And now we'll put it into the ferric chloride, still wet with water from being washed as well. And it's on a little steel hook that I just put through one of the um, handle fastener holes to hang it down in there by. I just use um, mild steel rebar tie wire. It doesn't matter if it gets etched too. Now we're going to have a little bit of a look at, you know, are we having any spots in our finish on the blade? How's it looking? I f you can see I felt it with my fingernail to see if it had any depth yet, which it didn't much. So I, I come back every now and then again and check for depth. Um, here we have anhydrous ferric chloride, 500 grams. And uh, this is what I tend to mix with water, high media is a good manufacturer and usually fairly inexpensive. I just mix that to whatever strength I want in water. And if my etch bath gets a little weak after a while, I add a little bit more ferric. I save old toothbrushes so I can scrub oxides off. It helps the etch keep biting cleanly and uh, I can actually get a look, a better look if I scrub the oxides off at, at what everything is looking like. And every time I'm going to, I scrub the oxides off of the entire guard, everything that's going to get coffeed, have a feel for depth and etch more if necessary. So now I'm rinsing just with water, ferric chloride off of everything real quick. I always use cold water for this stuff. Warm water tends to let the, tends to dr actually dry the blade. 
the blade with the blade warm it dries off quicker in the air and you don't want it drying off because then it'll start to set some yellow colors here's simple green to neutralize the remaining ferric chloride good spray all over Windex also a good choice and now I'm just gonna kinda rub my hand around on everything you can see that's just taking some more oxides off and that is totally fine um, they would be coming off anyway. Now I'm going to use some 2000 grit paper and uh, my sanding backer and do some by hand too. I'm using that little scrap of baler belt as a backer again. 2000 grit wet sanding the entire surfaces of everything. The 15 and 20 hadn't colored up much but there were some detail areas particularly around the plunge and stuff that I needed to brighten up and I'm just scuffing everything lightly. It works really well under the tap with water. Smears everything less. The sandpaper clogs less. You get the 15 and 20 brighter without washing as much as the blacks out. Just getting every little detail. The tang a little bit too. Just getting the oxides off of it and the back of the guard. Now, I still avoid knocking the nail polish off of my trademark. I just use the the detail sanding pad to get right up to it on all sides but I'm careful not to disturb it because I need it to be on there throughout the um, coffee procedure as well and then uh, I try to do this all pretty quickly and then go back and hit the first side again just to make sure nothing colored up while I was sanding the other side again all cold water I'm doing the handle frame as well um, off camera I put the blade in the coffee I believe and it's in there while I'm sanding the handle frame I wouldn't just have it sitting around wet on the counter or something so same deal 2000 grit by hand getting every little detail making the 15 and 20 look like it will when it's done just bright and at about 2000 grit it's very easy to put a high polish on it when it was 400 grit then etched and then you hit it up wet with 2000 makes it look really bright and we're going right into the coffee wet with the handle frame here and the blade is also down in there so I just look for whatever part of the black on the, the blade or the handle washed out the most with wet sanding and I put it down in the coffee and I keep checking that spot and when that spot is black then I know the rest of the blade is good now we're rinsing coffee off with cold water again. And uh, now I've just taken off the nail polish, just scraped it off with my fingernail. I am neutralizing the whole thing with Windex. And now I am putting some blue dish detergent and using just a polyester sponge here, regular old dish sponge and water just hitting it up with soap and water after I've neutralized it this makes the coffee not yellow up on you a lot of people have a problem with a coffee finish looking good at first and then it then the 15 and 20 will yellow up a little bit over time that's because of the coffee oils the acidic coffee oils you need to not only neutralize the acids but you need to wash the oils off with actual dish detergent and then they won't do that to you anymore cold water so the blade doesn't dry early I'm going to blot it dry with a hand towel. Get my hands pretty dry too. Blot, blot, blot everything. I'm going to finish dry everything with a paper towel. And these are good paper towels. They're like cloth-like ones. I'm working very quickly on this. And then I pour some mineral oil, get another paper towel, and just hose the whole thing down with mineral oil as quickly as possible. Every second that you have that freshly etched 15 and 20 exposed to the air without any oil on it is an opportunity for it to color up on you once you get some oil on it you're pretty safe and uh, if if I've gotten my finish on my coffee and everything just right I won't really see the coffee coloring up the paper towel too much when I'm putting oil on it it's pretty stable at this point you can see that I've got a warm burner on underneath this process and I warm the steel of the blade up intermittently and more toward the end of the process just um, to open the surface of the steel a little bit and allow the oil to actually
penetrate a little bit better or lock onto the surface. That's just an old thing from Wayne Goddard. I read his books quite a lot when I started out. Parts of them haven't aged well, but the most important thing about Goddard's work, that can-do spirit of, like, build your own tools, make it happen, that is timeless. So we got everything hosed down with oil, tang and everything, and uh, the finish is looking pretty good. I like where it's at. Nice black blacks and nice shiny 15 and 20s. And uh, so I'll probably fuss with it a little bit more, but it needs to look good right out of the coffee. I, I don't sand it after I neutralize it, like ever. All right, <clears throat> let's put this bad boy together. We got the frame. And uh, we got the tang block. Tang block into the frame. Alignment pins into the frame front. That's snugged up with the nut. Okay. That's plus nice and flush. And snug it up some more. Yeah, now we're talking. That feels good there. Scales. Flip it over. Snug everything lightly at first. Come back and do a second round of snugging. Right now it's got mineral oil on it, but I think I'm going to probably finish everything up with some Axe Wax for a lasting protection and light sheen. Because that'll work on the Mammoth as well as the steel. I really like to get mineral oil all over the Mammoth. Cool, cool, cool. Well, the bolo's done. Check it out. Tide pool mosaic. Composite integral layup. Twisted W's explosion edge. Twisted W's integral guard. Thirteen inch blade, full takedown, construction, frame of twisted W's, stabilized, mammoth bark ivory scales, 
Lots of cool little pattern details around this thing. There's a star under the guard there. Had a blast making this. Hope you guys enjoyed the journey.